I trust that by now we would see how broad a subject fellowship is. And yet, God would have us to enjoy it with him. Uh, as I grow in my Christian walk, One of the things that is troubling to me, even to this day, and that is, I believe too many Christians are not enjoying Christianity. Too many Christians are not enjoying Christianity. And when I think of the depths that God has gone to bring us into a relationship with him and his son, it hurts my heart. When you read the scriptures and you see that God had you, he had me in mind before he said, let there be light. Let the earth bring forth. Let the sea bring forth. God had you and I in mind. It says we were chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundations of the world. That in the heart of God, He had a plan for mankind, and you and I were included in it. And the Apostle Paul says it was a mystery. It was hid in the heart of God. And throughout eternity, this that was in the heart of God just kept throbbing. How can I reveal it? When is the appropriate time? And it filled the heart of God throughout eternity past. Creation came. Man was formed. Man failed. And all throughout the thousands of years that has gone, that mystery was still hid in God's heart and it couldn't be revealed. And the scripture says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Man rejected him, crucified him. God raised him on the third day, received him up into glory and in glory. And God sent forth his spirit. And he gave men gift to preach his word. And that mystery that was hid in the heart of God has now been revealed through the apostles, and in particular, the apostle Paul. And you ask yourself, if something that has been hid in the heart of God for eternity past, throughout all these ages, and now God took the time to reveal it unto me, do I know anything about it? What do I know about that which was hid in the heart of God and now has been revealed? That's Christianity, beloved saints. That you and I, creatures of the dusk, are able to call the God of this universe our God and our Father. Just think about how it felt to the heart of the Lord Jesus when he said uh, to Mary, Go tell my brethren. I ascend to my father, their father, my God, your God. And I can just see us standing, huh? Yes, go tell them that message. That God the Spirit indwells our body. You know, no other religious group on planet Earth are able to say that. That they have divine persons living in them. 
that all the religions of the world cannot say they have fellowship with their God. Only the Christians can say that. The religions of this world, God has described their idols. They have eyes they cannot see, ears they cannot hear, mouth they cannot speak. Only the Christian worships a God that has a heart that can enter into how you feel. The pains of life, the difficulties, the challenges, our God is able to enter into them with us. The apostle can declare, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Beloved saints, only the Christian is able to say those things because the God that we serve is alive. And we have been brought into fellowship with him. And the question is, if you and I do not understand or enter into that which God has taken the time out to reveal, then we are just living a life here in this scene, uh, just going through it, going through the motions, and we are not enjoying that which God has given. Beloved saints, this is the second day of February. And I'm almost certain all the gifts we got for Christmas has been opened and used. Especially if you got an iPhone 5. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> An iPhone, Apple, whatever it is, is the fifth one. <laughs> All our gifts has been opened and enjoyed. And someone says, look, I'm tired of it. It's time for something else. But beloved saints, have we opened up and enjoyed the things that God has freely given to us as Christians? And that's the encouragement for us. You know, tomorrow is the big game. I said it's the big game. And you know, almost 75% of those who watch the game have never played football in their life. They're just fans. They're just fans. You see, fans don't have to play the game. You just have to enjoy it. And so all the millions of people are there to enjoy the game. Beloved says, why can't we enjoy our game? Why can't we? Brought into such relationship and privilege that day by day we're saying, we should be able to say, I am enjoying this which God has brought me into. But I can't enjoy it if I don't know anything about it. So with the help of the Spirit of God, we can enter into it and ask God to help me to understand what he has revealed concerning his Son. Because the more this book gets a hold of me, that's what we want. It's not so much me getting hold of the book. The book has to get hold of me. And if the Lord Jesus can get a hold of me, it is wonderful. When the Lord gets hold of me, brethren, our fellowship would be so sweet. We would be able to say the half has not been told. So we continue on. We would go to Leviticus chapter 7 and build on what we had in Leviticus chapter 3. I am not going to read all the verses, but the verses we have, uh, Leviticus 7 from verse 11 to verse 34. And we're just going to take some portions and just comment on them and build on what we had in chapter 3. So verse 11, Leviticus chapter 7, verse 11. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offering, which he shall offer unto the Lord. And then verse 12 says, if, his, if he offer it for a thanksgiving, 
and in verse 16, it says, If the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or voluntary offering. But as we go on, we had in chapter 3 that the fat and the blood was God's portion. That was God's food. So if we look at verse 30, it says, His own hands shall bring the offering of the Lord made by fire, the fat with the breast it shall he bring, that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before the Lord. And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons. So you have now the breast is for Aaron and his sons. Verse 32. And the right shoulder shall he give unto the priest for an heave offering of the sacrifice of your peace offering. So you have now the right shoulder shall be given to the priest that offered the sacrifice. So you have the breast for Aaron and his sons, and you have the right shoulder for the priest that made the offering. Verse 19. And the flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten, it shall be burnt with fire, and as for the flesh, all that be clean shall eat thereof. But the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offering that pertain unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. So you have the breast, the right shoulder. Verse 19 speaks of the rest of the sacrifice that was to be given to the rest of the people, was shared. So you have the different parts of the sacrifice. It's the same sacrifice animal that was offered in chapter 3. The fat was for God, and now the different parts distributed to others. And we can say now they are all enjoying the same sacrifice. So if you're enjoying the same thing, you're having fellowship with one another. And if God says, my portion is the fat, and I am enjoying that, and the rest of the animal is for you to enjoy, God is saying, come and have fellowship with me and with each other. We then now have to take it into New Testament language and show how now our, the fellowship we have been brought into for the Christians, how we apply it to what we have here in Leviticus chapter 3, Leviticus chapter 7. It has been defined this way that fellowship is having something in common. We have things in common and we can enjoy that which we have in common. And in this peace offering, we have the offering in common with each other. We are enjoying the same thing. And this is, what, this is where God wants us to get to. God knows uh, there's a hymn that, there's a words in a hymn that says, the father who only his excellent work. And in Matthew 11, the Lord Jesus says, no one knows the son but the father. But the Father desires to reveal him unto us. So only God the Father knows the true worth of his beloved Son. And he has brought us to this place where he is saying to us, if I can enjoy him and you have accepted him as your Savior, you can enjoy him as well. Fellowship. But we want to see now and maybe we should go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this way we can get that out of the way and build on 
what we have in Leviticus 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. It says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar? For us to appreciate and enjoy what we have as Christians, we have to appreciate what God has given to us concerning the Lord's table. That is where we as Christians come together to enjoy fellowship. And I would dare say, beloved saints, sometimes it's a disaster. We can be in so many places, so out of tune, so out of touch. So much confusion, you ask yourself, are we really enjoying that which God is enjoying? The table is as we have in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the altar is in the Old Testament, the table is in the New Testament. And if you look at the order in which the emblems are made mention of, in chapter 10, it mentions the blood first or the cup first. In chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, it says the cup of blessing which we bless and then it speaks about the bread which we break. In chapter 11, it says, concerning the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and then it speaks about he took the cup and he blessed it. So in chapter 10, it's presenting to us the Lord's table, and in chapter 11, it's presenting to us the Lord's supper. We have been brought into fellowship with one another and on the grounds of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can have fellowship with one another. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now, beloved saints, as we look upon that cup of wine, we walk through those doors. We look ahead of us. And we see there this container of wine, and it has to touch my heart. I see it, and I say to myself, what does the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ really mean to me? And all that it means to God, I say by the fact that I take of it, and I bless it, I speak well of it. We use the word eulogize. We, we are speaking well of this cup of blessing, this cup that God has given to us. I think upon the fact that uh, I have redemption through his blood, that it is his blood that has washed away my sins. I think of how God has been satisfied when that blood was poured out there on, at the cross of Calvary. God says, finally, I am satisfied in regards to man's sin. But it's not only that, beloved saints. Our sins are not the only issue. 
God's name and God's throne needed to be vindicated. Just think about what Satan was pointing into the face of God throughout all the generations that man has lived. In the Garden of Eden, the accusation was, God does not love you. God needed to address that issue. When the Lord Jesus uh, blessed the cup on the night in which he was betrayed, and what a night that was, beloved saints. The scripture always reminds us, it was the night in which he was betrayed. Betrayed by a familiar friend with that kiss which wanted to say to him, I love you. And the thought is Judas kissed him again and again so that the soldiers would not miss the one they were coming to take and to crucify. It was that night in which he was betrayed. He took the cup and he blessed it, but he said to his disciples, I will not drink of this cup until I drink it with you in the kingdom. Beloved saints, future eternity rested upon the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just our sins. We can sing about having that place, a home in heaven, in my father's house, are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. How? It had to be through his shed blood. And I come on a Lord's Day morning, beloved saints, do I have anything to say to God concerning the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? All oh, that it means. I say when I come, I have fellowship with this. Bread that we break. What a night it was. To think about the Lord Jesus sitting with his own. And only he alone who can really enter into this. As he took that loaf and he blessed it and he broke it. Oh, what went through his soul, beloved saints. Knowing the horrors of Calvary's cross. And he goes into the garden of Gethsemane. And he is praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And the scripture would declare that he prayed the more earnestly. And the sweat was pouring down to the ground as great drops of blood. Beloved saints, can you and I enter into it? Scripture says Peter was by the fire warming himself. Which tells me it was a cold night. But while Jesus prayed, he was sweating. Because he understood what Calvary's cross meant to him. And the blood, the sweat just flowed from his body. And dropped to the ground as great drops of blood. And he is crying, Father, if it be possible, let it pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. And he breaks the bread on that night in which he was betrayed. And who knows what went through his soul, knowing what his body would go through. Oh, beloved saints, his body was made an offering for sin. That body. The body that God looked upon, every member of that body that he had as a man was used for the good and glory of God. We use the members of our bodies for sin, but the Lord Jesus used the members of his body to glorify God, his physical body. He broke it. And he gave it to them. And he says, eat. This is my body given for you. Beloved saints, when I put my hand to that loaf and I break it, uh, and I want to say this, sometimes we break the bread. We don't break it. We pinch it. You need a magnifying glass to see how big the thing is. Brethren, let's break it. Let's break it. So what if your mouth get a little dirty? Break it. Eat. Not just suck the thing. No, beloved saints. 
Let's break it. Why? When you break that loaf, can you feel what the body of the Lord Jesus Christ went through for you? Can you? I believe every symbol has a meaning. You know, you just take it so lightly. But if you just break it, understand what his body was going through. I know many of you are going to start breaking from tomorrow. I can just see it. I can just see it now. <laughs> We're going to start breaking. But this is what God wants. He doesn't want these things to be routine. He wants us to enter into the reality of it. Break the bread. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He broke it. And oh, beloved saint, as the soldiers were whipped him that night and pierced his hands, his side, and uh, pierced his feet, oh, what that body went through. The crown of thorns upon his head. When I break that bread, I am entering into that. All of my sins was placed upon him. Beloved saints, he wants me to enter into that. What it cost him for my salvation, your salvation. When I break the bread, I ought to appreciate, Lord Jesus, your body was given for me. Do you think that was all? says his soul was made an offering for sin. Ah, three hours of darkness. Three hours of darkness when his soul was made an offering for sin. And we read the Psalms and we see all that he went through until the cry was heard. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the psalmist declared he had never seen the righteous forsaken. But this one on the cross of Calvary was forsaken of God. Heaven was hushed when the Lord Jesus Christ cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Heaven did not respond. It was for us, beloved saints. And the hymn writer penned it, Oh, for me, Lord Jesus Thou hast died. All of God's wrath was poured upon him. Then he cried, it is finished. The depth of all his sufferings, no heart, can ever conceive. And beloved saints, when I put my hand to that loaf on a Lord's Day morning, I say to myself, Lord, I cannot conceive it. But I wait for that day when I shall see you face to face and learn the glories of your grace. Oh, Lord Jesus, I sit here this morning with this loaf and this cup, and you have asked me to eat and drink in remembrance of you. And as I drink the cup and I eat the loaf, I am in communion of all that it speaks of, all that it means, not only to God the Father, but what it means to me. As I drink and as I eat, I'm in fellowship with each other. Why? Because we're at the Lord's table. It's the Lord's table where you and I have fellowship one with the other and with him. You see, I was sharing with Brother Saeed a few years ago, we were in Barbados at a young people's conference. And we were trying to encourage the young people about the privilege and the responsibility of the Lord's Supper. And the question was asked, and I will ask it here because I know we have people who love to cook in this place. 
They can whip anything up in a few minutes. But the question was asked, if you were to invite me to your house and you have this big spread, Sister Marva knows about it. Knows about it. Knows about it. They invite me to their house one day. Big spread. Fire going. And they say, Brother Joe, it's good to have you here. Sit and eat. And I says, uh, go ahead. I'll just watch the game. How do you think they would feel? That they invited me to their house to have fellowship with them around their table with a common meal, the best that money can offer. And I go to their house and I says, ah, you go ahead. How does the Lord feel when he has invited us to his table and he says, come and eat, have fellowship with me. And some of us says, not this year. You know, I still got to play my games and I still got to do this. Uh, not this year. Some of us have been baptized and we said, ah, not yet, not yet, not yet. What are you waiting for? Every Lord's Day that you come, the invitation has, is been given to you. Come and eat. And you say, not this week, not this month, not this year. What are you waiting for? But when I can just imagine what Sister Marva would say. And when she starts to talk like a Jamaican, you don't even want to understand what she's saying. Because she's going to tell me off. I invited this. Can I say it like a yard man? I invited this. I, no, I, I'm not going to go there. I invited this man to my house. I cooked all this food for this man. And he walked away and left everything on my table. Beloved saints, that's what we do. There's no appreciation for the table and the supper and the Lord. And God is saying, I have invited you. Come and enjoy what I am enjoying. The supper speaks of what delighted the heart of God. And beloved saints, it was Calvary's cross that proved God's delight in his beloved son because his searching eye of judgment pierced through that body, pierced through his soul. And when all was said and done, God says, I'm fully glorified. God can raise him from amongst the dead, seat him in the highest place in heaven, crown him with glory and honor. Why? Because God was satisfied and Calvary's cross proved it all. That is what Calvary's cross did. Prove that all that God said concerning his beloved son is true. God says, come. Enjoy him with me. <laughs> and we say, fellowship? That's for you people. No. Fellowship is for all of us. I say to my young people, it is for you as well. I say to the older ones, it is for you as well. And if you cannot enjoy the Lord Jesus around his table, there's nowhere else you can enjoy him. Amen. Nowhere else. Try what you may. You will never be able to enjoy the Lord Jesus except you enjoy him around his table with his supper. That is what God has left for us, Christians in this scene. That's the challenge. That is what speaks to my heart as a Christian. Am I really enjoying Christianity? Am I? So I come to the Lord's table. And God says, we, you have fellowship with the cup and with the loaf. And also we see in the one loaf something unique. Before it's broken, 
I walk through those doors. I look up at the table. I see one loaf. And I says, man, all the children of God represented in that one loaf. Be what they may. And every Lord's Day morning, I look at that one loaf and I says, God, I do not understand it. How? That people all over the world, some we have never met, some we don't even know what they, they look like, but I see them in this one loaf. Only the Lord Jesus could do such a work. It was in uh, Caiaphas who said, yeah, one needs to die. And then it says that all the people of God who are scattered may be brought into one. Now, he didn't know what he was saying. God knew. And when I look at the loaf, unbroken, I see all the people of God in one body. And I've been brought into fellowship with that. One body. Testimony for God upon the earth. Beloved saints, we have made a mess of things. We have really made a mess of things. We have to show forth all that this means to the world and to each other. What it means to be a part of the body of Christ. That the members have the same care. The same care, beloved saints, one for the other. It has always been said, you know, we, myself, we've had, and the younger ones, we've had the privilege, I wouldn't even call it a privilege, but the fact that we have been able to live during a period of time when there are wars all over the place. But one of the things we learn from the U.S. military, anyone get wounded on enemy territory, you know what they do? Leave him behind? You must be kidding me. A U.S. military person never leaves the wounded on enemy's territory. They do whatever they can to bring him home. Beloved saints, how many are wounded among us? And we are leaving them in enemy's territory. We jump in our... Uh, helicopters and our tanks and in our, M M in our MVs and we drive away and we leave them in the enemy's territory. No, the members of the body has the same, the same care one for the other. We don't leave them behind. That's fellowship. Because the military says you are one of us. Sanctify. Always faithful. That's what we need, beloved saints. So that when one gets wounded, we says, whoa, 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 we can't leave without him. Yes, he might be holding us back, but we, we got to go and get him. Think a little bit. See how many we have left behind. How many saints, beloved? are hurting. We have left them behind because we have not demonstrated what it is to have the same care one for the other. I have no need of you. That's not Christian language. No. The members of Christ's body has to, must have the same care one for the other, fellowship. When I come on a Lord's Day morning and it says I have communion with the cup and communion with the loaf, I am embracing all of those things. So young people, there might be some older saints that 
needs for a springtime. They said Groundhog said we're going to have a short winter. Winter is right around the corner. Can you believe that? But springtime is around the corner. There might be some of the older saints who might need their windows washed. So, you know, I'm making a bid to get your windows washed. Maybe you might want to give them a hand. Because the members of the body has the same care one for the other. And we can go on and on and on. But that's how we express fellowship, beloved saints. See, the Lord's Supper is not something we just come on a Lord's Day and we do. The Lord's Supper is something we live. I come on a Lord's Day morning and it gives me what I need until I come the next Lord's Day. You see, I do it until he comes. I anticipate that he may come on Monday. And I, I look for him to come maybe Tuesday. And if he doesn't, maybe Wednesday. Maybe Thursday, maybe Friday, maybe Saturday. And Saturday I see he, he hasn't arrived as yet. So I said, oh, brethren, we need a loaf and a cup. And I set the table. And I come on the Lord's Day morning and I, I break bread again. And I drink of the cup with the anticipation that he's going to come. And I go on through the week again, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and he doesn't come. And I says, brethren, we got to get together to break the bread because we are doing this until he comes. Oh, beloved saints, every day of the week, the Lord's Supper impacts me. Because I know he can come at any moment. But if he doesn't come, there is that which thrills my heart and thrills my soul. That is the supper. I don't want to miss it for anything because it speaks to me of the Savior that loves me and he is coming soon and it may be tonight, oh God help us, that he comes again very soon. We pray even so, Lord Jesus, come. But until that moment dawns, my privilege and responsibility is to come together Break the bread, drink the cup. I am in communion, fellowship with all that it speaks of. So much, so much. So we go back to Leviticus chapter 7. <clears throat> so in... <clears throat> We have that which Aaron and his sons enjoy, that which the priest who offered the sacrifice enjoy, verse 31, 32, and that which the rest of the people enjoys in verse 19. So let's just pick out a few points from this, encourage our hearts as we go forward. So in verse 12, it says, Leviticus 7, verse 12, If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil, a fine flour fried. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. And of it, he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for an heave offering unto the Lord, and it shall be the priest that sprinkleth the blood of the peace offering. One thing I would just point out here, um, we made mention that in the early chapters of Leviticus, you have the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, the trespass, no, the sin, and then the trespass offering. It comes in that order. But when you get to the law of the offerings, God gives it in a different order. The instructions for the peace offering is given last. So which tells me it is very important, the peace offering. So here it is. He is laying out for us that which also the offerer offers along with the animal sacrifice. 
So in verse 12, it speaks about unleavened cakes, anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fry. Beloved saints, when we come together, God delights for us to tell him of his beloved son. You see, if you go into the offering, you would see what he's offering here in verse 12 is really that which resembles very much the meal offering. It's an offering of fine flour, and that speaks of the life of the Lord Jesus. There was no blemish. There was no spot in his life. There was no unevenness, and those of us who love to bake and so forth knows the importance of having flour that is well even. They say you get good products out of it. This was the life of the Lord Jesus. There was no unevenness in it, in his life. And so the offerer was to uh, bake these things, and he had to offer it along with the animal sacrifice of the peace offering. But then look at this. Verse 13. Besides the cakes, now that's the cakes of verse 12, the unleavened cakes. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leaven bread, which is kind of strange. Because we know leaven speaks of that which is evil. Leaven speaks of that which refers to sin. Why now, in this offering to the Lord, leaven is permitted? You see, beloved saints, God is so gracious. We might have to edit this part. You see, when I get to my feet, or I read a portion of scripture on a Lord's Day morning, because I have a nature in me that likes to puff itself up, I might be offering to God that which has leaven in it. I want to sound so eloquent. I want to sound as though I know it, I understand it. Brethren, it takes effort, it takes time, it takes real self-judgment. And now we're not telling our young men, don't get involved in the meeting. We're not saying that at all. You know what? Because I have made mistakes on a Lord's Day morning. I remember... I got up and I gave thanks for the emblems. And afterwards, a brother said to me, I was young in the faith. He said, you know, you didn't thank the Lord for the bread, you know. Have you ever experienced that? That the brother got up, giving thanks for the emblems. He said everything, but he forgot to give thanks for the bread. I've done it. I have thanked the Father for dying on the cross for me. I've done it. I have said things when I checked the scripture, I didn't quote it right. I've done it. I've done it. But we thank God despite all of our weaknesses, all of our shortcomings, all of our failures, and we're not condoning it. We encourage our young men and all of us, older ones as well, get into the scriptures. Let us appreciate what God has done, what God has given to us, so that when I offer my thanksgiving to the Lord, it is that which is well acceptable to him. You see, when it speaks of the unleavened, that is which typifies Christ. So there cannot be any leaven in him. God is very careful the way he presents things. When it speaks of Christ, no leaven. But when it speaks about that which I am offering, I 
ever have to be careful of that nature in me that loves to puff itself up. And it does even at the breaking of bread. We have to be careful of that. So we have the, the leavened cakes and uh, no, the unleavened cakes and the leavened bread, and that is offered. And this is for a thanksgiving. So the in offering to the Lord, the offering of the peace offering, I can offer it uh, for a thanksgiving. Or I can offer it as a vow. And in verse 15, we have 15 and 16. Verse 16 says, But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offer his sacrifice, and on the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. So you have two aspects of the peace offering. You have it for a thanksgiving or praise, and you have it as a vow in which you can serve the Lord. You're vowing to the Lord, this is what I will do, and so forth. And it's presented as a peace offering. And we keep in mind, it all speaks of how the Lord Jesus Christ was offered. The Lord Jesus Christ was offered to God as a sweet savior. Oh, the depth of all that he went through here upon this earth. <sighs> what a life. You know, we are asked to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reason of a saving. You know, the Lord Jesus did that. Everything that he did, just ascended up to God. Ascended up to God. He says, the works that I do, now, even the words that he spoke are the words that were given to him of his father. His words, his works, everything. Received it from his father, did it, spoke it. All delighted the heart of his God and father. But then it says um, in verse 16, But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offered his sacrifice, and on the morrow also that remaineth of it shall be eaten. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice of the, on the third day shall be burnt with fire. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering be eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be imputed unto him that offer it, it shall be an abomination, and the soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity. Just one word of caution. The Lord desires freshness. And it's my responsibility to ever be in the scriptures to get something fresh of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, the instruction is being given here, and we're making the application. You offer something today, fresh. God says, the second day, the third day, be careful. Don't come with the same thing every single day. Come with something fresh. Too many of us, beloved saints, too many are simply at the point, I thank you, Lord, for dying for my sins. Too many of us are, come see a man who told me all ever I have done. After 20 years, no way. God says, get something fresh. Don't carry it over week after week after week. No, get something fresh. One of the beauty of the children of Israel in the wilderness, every morning, they had to get up and get a fresh gathering of manna every morning. 
On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, and they gathered enough for themselves. Nothing went to waste. And beloved saints, it's an encouragement for me that I don't hit the snooze button in the morning and I get up so that I can get something fresh from the Lord. To think of the depths of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You think of all of his glories, brethren, and we are only at, I thank you for dying for me after 20 years? No. It's too much. Too much. The queen says, when she saw Solomon in all of his glory, he says, the half has not even been told me. And brethren, the, the, the little that we scratch, it's only a scratch surface. There's so much to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we need to get into. Come with something fresh. We don't want to take it into the third day. God says, when you start doing that, that's an abomination. He will have to bear his iniquity. God wants us, beloved saints. Understand it. It's fellowship we have in. Don't you think? When we come together on a Lord's Day morning, even the saints profit from what you say. That there, so, there should be something that comes from your lips that refreshes their heart. And the brethren go, mm. <laughs> We are enjoying it. Mm. That's the brethren too. Yes, brothers. Isn't it nice when you, you, you turn in your scripture, a sister, or they might be looking in their hymn book and they're meditating. Oh, and then a brother rises up. What they are meditating on or looking at is what the Spirit of God led the brother to call or we sang it. And the sister goes, hmm. Something fresh. God wants us to have freshness. Freshness. But then in verse 19 it says, and the flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burnt with fire. And as for the flesh, all that be clean shall eat thereof. But the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offering that pertains unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. It's one of the things we have to encourage ourselves in. How do I prepare for Lord's Day morning? How do I prepare? Beloved saints, there is so much in this world that is defiling. So much in this world that is defiling. I've been saying to myself lately, Joe, you have to put the remote down. And what I am discovering, even when I hit that button, and I say that I just want to see what this show is all about, sometimes some of the language I go, Pow. brethren, how much curse words enter into your soul on a Saturday night? And you know you have to come here on a Lord's Day morning. How much moment of sexual images do you see? during the week and in particular on a Saturday night. 
and you know you're coming here on a Lord's Day night. To fellowship now, you're coming to fellowship. How much of the world has occupied me during the week, and in particular, on a Saturday night? You see, God can only dwell amongst a people who are holy. And yes, we might have liberty to do some things, but beloved saints, I say it healingly. There are things which do defile us. They do. And the scripture says, look, if you're going to be partaking of the peace offering, you have to keep yourself clean. If you want to come and really enjoy fellowship with each other and with the Lord, we have to keep ourselves clean. All the things that this world has to offer, and beloved saints, where we are, I remember a few years ago, when I read Romans 1, and it speaks about those who have pleasure in those who do those wicked things, I shun. Beloved saints, if I am against adultery in my own life, in the life of the saints, why is adultery making me laugh. Why? What's so funny about adultery? What's so funny about fornication? There's nothing funny about it, brethren. What's so funny about gays? What's so funny about that? There's nothing funny about Brethren, we laugh at it. It entertains us. No. If I want to enjoy the peace offering, where I am saying I am in fellowship with individuals and with God, I got to watch how clean I am. Because I, I tell you, brethren, you know, I, I remember, and I like to just share my weakness, my four shortcomings. <laughs> I remember I was at the supermarket one, one day. I got to the cash register. And this song from either the late 70s, early 80s was playing. Boogie, oogie, woogie, get down, boogie, oogie, woogie. One Lord's Day morning, I'm at breaking a bread. <laughs> and you know how brethren do it. Real holy position. Meditating. And what flashes through my mind? Boogie, oogie, woogie. <laughs> but I thank God it has only happened to Brother Joe. So that is why we have to guard our minds. We have to guard our hearts. Because these things flashes through our minds. Even during the breaking of bread, beloved saints. And if I pump it into me, and I allow the world to just come in as a flood, it affects how we fellowship. It affects it. It affects the highest fellowship that we have. At the Lord's table. Brethren, if we say we have been enjoying Christ, wherever he is, I want to be. And we can go into the prayer meeting. We can go into the Bible reading. We can go into the ministry meeting. Beloved saints, I say to us, if I don't see Christ, 
if I don't appreciate the fact that he is there, it affects my fellowship. Because it goes back to what I said from the beginning. Where there's bad relationships among saints, we don't want a fellowship. But when I realize Christ is there, Christ is there where the twos and the threes are. I want to be there. And I say to myself, Lord, if you're in the midst of the two or the threes, I want to be one of the two. I want to be one of the three. Why? Because I say we have things in common. And if we have things in common, brethren, we can enjoy fellowship with each other. So everyone, God first, he has the fat, Aaron and his sons, they have the shoulder, the priest that offered has the, the breast, Aaron and his son has the breast, the priest has the shoulder, and the rest of the people have the rest of the offering. And everyone sits around the table and they enjoy fellowship with one another and with God. Picture in your mind, the prodigal had gone away, wasted his father's money, righteous living. But he comes home comes home and the father says kill the fatted calf kill the fatted calf let's eat drink and be merry servants you name it everyone was supposed to join in to feast on this fatted calf Christ Come, let's be merry. And then the eldest son is outside. I'm not going. I'm not going. And then he starts finger pointing. That's what we do. I'm not going. I'm not going. Christ was in the center. Christ was saying, forget all that your brother did. All I want you to do is enjoy the fatted calf. Forget about all that he did, the father. Forget all that your brother did. Just come with me and enjoy the fatted calf. Father was saying, come and fellowship with me. Come and fellowship with me. And if you and I are caught up with what each other have done, we will never enjoy the fatted calf. We will never enjoy the peace offering. We will never enjoy the portion that is ours to enjoy. We will never do it. Why? Because we spend more time in this way. Come in. Come in. And enjoy the fatted calf. Enjoy the peace offering with God the Father. Like I said, brethren, I am not a teacher. <laughs> we can break down this chapter and go so many different ways, I confess. But my desire is that we would be stirred up. Brethren, we have to enjoy our Christian lives. And most of all, we have to enjoy the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not enjoying him. If we are honest with ourselves, we have to say we're not enjoying him. 
yet still he comes with outstretched arms. Come, come, come. So may these thoughts, brethren, speak to us. May they speak to us. May they speak to me. Because you see, the, the saints have to see the preacher live it as well. That's important. You have to see the preacher live it. And if I am not enjoying it, you will tell. If I am not at the meeting, I can't tell you to come. I can't. But if you see me enjoying Christ, you will want to enjoy Christ as well. So just in case you thought you were going to hear all those things of fellowship and I disappointed you, I say praise the Lord. But I know where we can really enjoy fellowship. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we enjoy him, I believe all would be well. Let's forget about ourselves. Let's forget about the faults of each other. God will deal with it in due time. Let's just go in and enjoy the things that God would have for us to enjoy. You know why? The Lord Jesus is soon to come. He is soon to come. And how sad it would be that there are things that I could have enjoyed on this side of eternity. And he says, Joe, you know what? You never enjoyed it. You have five Bibles in your house different versions, different print. And this is all you know? All you know of my son? Brethren, may we press on as we wait his soon return. May we press on.